for the promise and the opportunity of everlasting life. I want to ask you to stand with me as we go into our message for today. If you have your Bibles with you while you're standing, I want to invite you to go with me to the book of 2 Samuel. The book of 2 Samuel. We're going to go to chapter 22. When you get there, if you would, just please say amen. 2 Samuel, chapter 22. Our message today um, is simply titled, How Committed Are You? How Committed Are You? And... Um, Sister Marie, I was reading the Sabbath school lesson. I try not to read the Sabbath school lesson until I'm done with my message. Um, but once the message was done, once I knew where, what I was going to be talking about, uh, it got to Wednesday. And Wednesday, the title of the lesson for Wednesday is a call to commitment. And I'm like, wow, thank you, Lord. Just get to build on Sabbath school. And it says, Revelation's appeal is a urgent call to commitment. Summarized in the symbolism of the two women in Revelation. Although at times it will appear that God's people will be defeated in this cosmic controversy between truth and error, God promises that his church will triumph in the end. God gives a promise that there's going to be a result. God controls what he's going to do, but it's also important for us to understand that we need to do what we can do. How committed are you? And so, Miranda, I was uh, reading through, I am reading through the Bible, um, trying to read through in less than a year, try to do this every single year, and right now I'm in uh, going back and forth between Samuel and Psalms, kind of putting those pieces together as David is going on this journey. And we're going to pick up in chapter 22, verses 1. And I think we may read down to verse 4. That'll be good. That'll be good to just set the scene. Word of God for the people of God. I'm reading from the New King James Version, chapter 22, beginning in verse 1. It says, Then David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. On the day when the Lord had delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. And he said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer the God of my strength, in whom will I trust? My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge. My Savior, you save me from violence. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. Elder Johnson, what we're able to see is that God will do what God is supposed to do. But the question today is how committed are you? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy which endures forever. We thank you so much, Lord, for loving us with an everlasting love and the fact that salvation has been extended to each and every one of us. We thank you, Lord, 
for doing your part. We thank you, Lord, for extending the call. But today, Lord, I pray that you give us a gut check. We appreciate all that you've done. We are thankful for all that you've done. But the question on the table today is, are we doing all that we can do to each and every day align ourselves with you? This is a personal question, which requires a personal answer. And so I'm praying, Lord, that you will help us be honest and transparent with ourselves first, that we might be able to be honest and transparent with you. Open our minds and help us to conceive what it is you're going to say to us today. Open our hearts and help us to receive it, yea, even to believe it. And then, Lord, I'm praying that you will prepare our hands to do what you're going to call us to do, our feet to go where you're going to call us to go, our mouths to speak what you're going to call us to speak. And in times, Lord, where we just need to be quiet, I pray that you will help us to keep our mouths closed. It is our prayer today that you would be glorified and we would be edified. So we cry out today, have your way, Lord. Speak, for your children are listening. This is our humble prayer. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. How committed, how committed are you? It is NBA playoffs time, NHL playoffs time. There are a couple teams that are fighting for their way to the NBA finals. And as I considered not just the NHL and the NBA, but I considered life, I came to the understanding, Sister Pierre, that each and every one of us at some point in time are going to be expected to be a part of a team. And as we join said team, Sister Elsa, I've come to understand that we would be responsible for having a level of commitment. Notice that I said we will each have a level of commitment, but I did not say that we would each have the same level of commitment. Right? I found that we can be on a team with individuals and our level of commitment be at one place, but our team members' level of commitment be at a completely different place. I found that it's possible for us to be on a team with an individual, but for some of us to say, if something goes this way, I am off the team, while others say they're on the team all the way to the end. It reminds me of a movie that I watched, Elder Johnson, some time ago. Uh, this particular movie had a scene in it where they started to mimic uh, the Black Panthers in their early days. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this movie. It's a movie by the name of Barbershop. Well, well, in this particular scene, the young Black Panthers were there, and they were upset with the way that the police were treating them. They, they were in a room, Mike, and they were saying, we don't like the way that they're treating us. The leader would, would say something, and they would all shout, yeah, we, we feel the same way that you do. And, and the scene goes on, and he says, you know what? The FBI is after us, but we're going to continue to give food to the children in the neighborhood, and we're going to continue to do after-school care, even though the police are after us. And they yell, yeah, that's what we're going to do. And they said the police are going to come, and they're going to have their guns, but we're not worried because we're going to get our guns. And they shouted, yeah, we're going to get our guns and he said they gonna shoot us and we gonna shoot them and one of the individuals in the group was like hold on now because there's a limit to our commitment some individuals were still on board with him so he took it to another level he said they gonna kill us and we gonna kill them and we gonna all die together camera pans over to one individual and he's like, no, nah, man, I didn't sign up for this. And I just wonder how many of you all in this room have found yourself on teams with individuals and they start moving in a certain direction and you find yourself, wait a minute, I didn't sign up for this because what I've come to understand is though we may find ourselves on a team, 
we don't all have the same level of commitment. Sister King, it took me some time to understand and accept the fact that each of us has a limit. I knew that there were individuals who had different types of limitations as to their commitment, but I took some time to really get to a point where I accepted the fact that there would be individuals on my team that would have a different level of commitment. I mean, I had seen it on my job that there were some individuals who would not do extra work unless there was extra pay attached to it. They came in and did just enough to say that they came to work and did just enough to get paid. But if you ever ask them to stay later, the first question off their lips, well, are you going to pay me more to stay later? I learned that in relationships, there are individuals who are open to certain things happening in the relationship, but, but, but not open to other things happening. In this world, in 2023, there are some individuals that have committed to come together and operate in an environment where they have an open relationship. They have no problem with the individual that they're connected to going out and having relationships with other individuals and then coming back home. That's their their responsibility and their, their obligation, if you will, or their prerogative is the word that I'm looking for. There are some individuals that are open to the fact that they've entered into an open relationship. But I also find it interesting that while there are individuals with that limit, there are other individuals with different limits. They might be willing to have an open relationship, but they're not willing to put their finances together. Can you imagine coming together, being with someone that's supposed to be on your team, but having the expectation that for the rest of our lives, mine is going to be mine and yours is going to be yours. I submit to you that I've counseled many individuals who've come together and said, we're going to have a prenup before we get together. Or maybe just maybe we're not going to do a prenup, but we're not going to put our finances together. What I found is that in relationships, it's possible for individuals to have limitations. Even in school, I have found, Rose, that there are individuals who seek after straight A's. And there are other individuals that believe that C's get degrees. Those individuals have said they're not going to put a lot of work into their grades. As long as they pass, that's all that matters. As long as they get that degree, that's all that matters. Their GPA does not matter. All they want to do is make sure that they graduate. There are limits in life. But I found that even in church, we may find ourselves serving the same God, but we may serve him in different ways. So with that, there are two important questions that I want to ask you today. Do you know how committed you are? Have you determined your level of commitment? Your commitment to your job, your commitment to your relationships, your commitment to your education, and even your commitment to your church. Do you know how committed you are? And the second question I wanna ask you today is, does your behavior reflect your level of commitment? See, it's one thing for us to say how committed we are, but it's another thing for us to live out our commitment. And I found that the key to any relationship, any effective team, I found that the key to success lies in our ability to have effective communication. Go with me to the text. We're going back to 2 Samuel, and we're going to end up in chapter 23. We read David's praise in chapter 22, but I want to ask you to go with me to chapter 23. David now is at the end of his life. As a matter of fact, verse 1 tells us that these are the last words of David. Elder Pierre, David has lived his life. He's been the best king that he could possibly be. And now his time is wrapping up. 
And as David gets to this point, the text doesn't just focus on David, but it focuses on the individuals that spent their time around David. And I want to ask you to jump down with me to verse 8, where it really picks up talking about David, but not so much about David, but about David's mighty men. Uh, some of you may know that David started out as king, and he did not rule the whole nation. As a matter of fact, he got leadership of half the nation because there was another half that just wasn't ready to follow David yet. As a matter of fact, those of you who know David's story know that he was anointed to be king, but he did not become king until some years later. Uh, as a matter of fact, David was at a point of running for, for his life. Saul was chasing after him. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel that some individuals began to surround David. And all of the individuals that surrounded David were individuals that were in debt, were individuals that were at risk of going to jail, were individuals that the Bible called scoundrels. And so David has been anointed to be king, Elder Steele, but he's surrounded not by noble men and men of prestige, but he's surrounded by all the individuals that many of us would not want to spend time around. But that's not David's story when we get to 2 Samuel. First Samuel chapter 22, we find that he's running around with all of the knuckleheads, all of the individuals that you would look at and say they're going to grow up and amount to nothing. All of the individuals who were uh, uh, being foreclosed on and the individuals who had not paid their debts. He was surrounded by all of the scoundrels, the Bible says. But when we get to chapter 23 of Second Samuel, David is now running with a different group of individuals. The Bible says in verse eight. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Forgive your pastor, as I am sure to mispronounce some of these names. But the first individual listed is Joshebeth, Bashabeth, the Tachmanith, chief amongst the captains. He was called Adino, the Esnite, because he had killed 800 men at one time. That was a bad boy. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ohanite, the Ohahite, sorry about that, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines who would gather there for battle and the men of Israel had retreated. Here's what this brother did, verse 10. He arose and attacked the Philistines until his hand was weary and his hand stuck to the sword. The Lord brought about a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to plunder. And after him was Shema, the son of Aji, the Herorite. The, Philist the, the Philistines had gathered together into a troop where there was a piece of ground full of lentils. So the people fled from the Philistines. But this brother stationed himself in the middle of the field, defeated it, and killed the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory. Then three, verse 13, of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephraim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. Can I just stop right here and paint a picture? David is surrounded now, not by individuals who are known as scoundrels, but individuals who are known as warriors and men of prestige and esteem. These are individuals that you would have posted on your wall as superheroes. These were, at that time, modern-day Iron Men and Batman who were willing to go out to war on behalf of the nation. One brother, it said, defeated 800 individuals by, them, by himself. He, one other individual went down and stood in the field and was fighting for so long that, that the sword that was in his hand was stuck to his hand. These are the individuals that David is surrounded by. These are the individuals who are men of esteem, but not only men of esteem, but men who have decided that they're willing to put everything on the line for the success of the nation. So I ask the question, 
How committed are you? For your church, for your family, for that individual you're in that relationship with, for the success that you say you want to achieve, how committed are you? If you were to see five people coming down the street, 10 people coming down the street, 100 people coming down the street, all in opposition to you and all that you're supposed to stand for. Are you going to stand firm and stand strong or in the face of danger, are you going to retreat and change your mind? How committed are you? What are you standing for and how long are you willing to stand? Have you determined whether you're going to give up, whether you're going to give in, and do you truly know when that time is? I've come to understand, Elder Horton, that each and every one of us has a limit. Each and every one of us has a breaking point. And I will submit to you that it is important, stay with me, for you to know how far you're willing to go in this thing called life to achieve those things that you say you want to achieve even as it relates to your relationship with God. How committed are you? Does it depend on the day and what events are going on? Does it depend on who's around you and who else is going to be there? Or have you committed that you are staying steadfast on what God would have you to do, come what may? Have you committed that you are sold out to doing God's will all the way to the end? We see here that David was surrounded by individuals who were committed to give their life for the success of the nation. Verse 15. They're in this stronghold. The Philistines are on the other side. What we begin to see is that the battle with the Philistine was not just a one-time situation, but over and over again, the Philistines came to attack the children of Israel, trying to take their spot and wipe them off the face of the earth. And so even when 800 individuals had been defeated, they went back and regrouped and they came back again. Even when 500 individuals were defeated, they went back and regrouped and came again. And I need you to understand that the Philistines represent the adversary that is coming after us. Listen, there may be some times where you might pray him away, but do not believe that he has stopped antagonizing you. For he is going to go back and he's going to regroup, and I need you to know that he is coming back again. And if you have believed that that one moment of success is going to guarantee you success against the adversary for the rest of your life, I need you to know that you have deceived yourself. Because until Jesus cracks the sky, until Jesus puts it into this, the adversary has already said he is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Yes, you may win and get the victory one day. Yes, things may go well for you today, but that does not mean that the adversary is not coming back for you tomorrow. I think one of the dangers for us as Christians is that we have one moment of success and we begin to believe that that success is going to carry over for the rest of our life. We believe that that moment of victory it's going to be the way that things are for as long as we live. And we miss the fact, join us, that there are times in which we can win today, but we can turn around and lose tomorrow. We miss the fact that the adversary that came to us today is not done with us, but he will be back tomorrow. And so it's important for us to understand and determine and even communicate our level of commitment now because some of us in this room think we're ready for the adversary to come our way but without Jesus I need you to know that you are no match for him I submit to you that you can't stand by yourself you can't fight him on your own you might get a couple licks in but I need you to know that by yourself you are going to be defeated but God gives us some encouragement David is here, the children of Israel, the Philistines are on the other side, and he issues 
a challenge. Verse 15 with me, if you still have your Bible. And David said with longing, Oh, that someone would give me a drink of water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. Y'all see that? Hold on, wait, wait, wait. David is the king at this moment. And David asks for something to drink. But David asks for something to drink from a specific location. Did anybody catch that location? He wants it from the well that's where? In Bethlehem. But guess who's at Bethlehem? The Philistines. So, bro, you telling me ain't no water that's good enough on this side? I mean, I can go to the store on this side and get you something to drink, but I don't know about going over on the other side where the enemies are to get you something to drink. But check this out. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate, took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. Hold on now. <laughs> Hold on, bro. Can we just have some real talk for a moment? Um, the Philistines are on the other side. David is the king, and David expresses, Henry, that he's thirsty. And he wants water from a certain location. He wants it from the well that's over by the gate in Bethlehem. And over by the well in Bethlehem is the enemy. And now these mighty men, because they were committed, suit up and say, we're going to get this water because our king wants some water. He's given us a tough command, but we're so committed to our king and to our nation that if this is what our king desires, we got to figure out how to get it. They go over and get the water, not a jug. but a cup, and they bring it back. Can I just stop right here? I mean, I, I just want to give us an opportunity to be honest. Are there certain things that God has asked you to do that you just like, yeah, nah, bro, I ain't going to be able to do it? Am I the only one in here who's gotten a request from God, heard a challenge from God, an expectation from God, and just has said, you know what, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this one. So all of y'all in here have heard things from God. <laughs> thank, thank you, Elder, for your honesty. Thank you so much for your honesty. I ain't going to say yes, I ain't going to say no. I'm going to just say it is what it is. But, but, here, but here's the thing, though. Like, I think it's important for us to understand, and this is why I'm asking you, how committed are you? Like, like, have you determined and been able to identify that even in your relationship with God, right? Like, on your job, there should be certain things that you're just like, yo, I'm just not going to do it. On your job. In that relationship with that individual that you're in that relationship with, there should just be some things that you're like, yo, I'm just not going to be able to entertain that. You got to have limitations. You have to have limitations because if you don't have limitations, and some of us have experienced this, if you don't set standards and expectations and limitations, individuals are going to run all over you. So you do it in your job. You do it in that relationship. Come on, y'all, can we just be honest that even with church, we got some limitations? I mean, certain things you can ask me to do, Pastor, but there's some other things. I don't care who you are. Not going to happen. So y'all just ain't going to tell the truth. So y'all want me to recall all the phone calls that I've had to make and individuals be like, Pastor, I love you, but. <laughs> but even with God. 
And I know we, we, it's tough for us to say this. But I think in order for you to truly get to a point where you're honest with God, you have to be honest with yourself. Like, we, we say, I'm sold out. I'm ready to do whatever. If you can use anything, Lord, you can use me until you actually decide to use me. Right? It sounds good when you ain't got no offers on the table. It's easy when you don't have no offers on the table. It's easy when you don't have no requests. It's easy for us to sit back and be like, yo, I wish somebody would or I would do this or like, yeah, but what happens when you're in the moment and now you got to make a decision? How many of us have told God no? And our actions while professing with our mouth that we're willing to do whatever God calls us to do. This isn't condemnation. This is just reality. I'm trying to help us get to a space where we have a better relationship with our God. Notice that David didn't go and specifically ask anybody to get him something. He's just sitting in his chair on a hot day, fanning himself, probably put that look on like he was just overwhelmed. He's like, man, I wish somebody would go get me something to drink. Man, I wish somebody would go get me something to drink from over behind the enemy lines. Because they got the best water over in Bethlehem. And I don't know if the three mighty men that end up going over there, I don't know if they were there in the room with David or if somebody came and was like, hey, David said he's thirsty. And he done lost his mind because he said he want only a certain type of water. I don't know if that's how it went. I don't know if this was like, man, the king done lost his mind. He tripping. Y'all know how we had those conversations where, like, those side conversations where we call somebody be like, you won't believe what they said today. They asked me to be such and such and such and such. They done lost their mind. I know they weren't talking about me. It happened. I don't know if it was like that, but somebody who heard what David said, whether they were in the room or whether they heard it by way of somebody else, these three men were like, well, the king wants something to drink, so guess what? We got to go get it because we committed to our king. At the end of the day, if he don't get something to drink, he might die of thirst. And if the king dies of thirst and the enemy hears about the king dying of thirst, guess what? They're going to be rejuvenated. Because in our morning, they're going to come and try to take over. So it's important for us to go and make sure that the king is taken care of so we can keep fighting this battle and beating the Philistines. Because the moment they hear that our king has, been, has died, we're going to be defeated. And so they go. They go get the water. Man, that's, that, that's some commitment. That's some serious commitment. Because, dude, you're not asking me to go around the corner. You're asking me to go behind enemy lines and get the water. Like, I don't know if you understand this. Like, you're putting my life at risk. But at the end of the day, I'm going to go and do it, King, because I'm committed to the mission. They go get the water, they bring it back, they put it in his hand, man, here it is. Ice cold, straight out of the well. And what does David do? He poured it out. Now this will give you an opportunity to be honest. How many of y'all would have felt disrespected? Like for real, how many of y'all would have been like, hold on man, I just put my life on the line to get that water and then you're going to turn around and pour it out? So only two of us in this room would have felt disrespected. You better just come on, man. Say what do you say? You gonna you gonna say what? You you finna drink this water? That I don't put my life on the line. Thank you so much for being honest in this place. Some of us are like man, I don't know where the pastor's about to go, so I can't raise my hand right now because he might check catch me up, man. I, these are all the rook players in here who are like I don't know what's coming down the pipe, so I'm I'm not gonna even listen. No, thank you for your honesty because I know. 
that there's a room full of individuals who feel the same way. How do I know? Because you do it with your significant other. When you spend time cooking and then they be like, nah, I ain't even hungry tonight. You're going to do what? What? <laughs> I know. You don't even have to testify, Samantha. I already know. I already know. I already know. Don't put nobody on the spot. <laughs> Listen. I know how it goes because I've been there. I done been in here cooking all day. You talking about you ain't hungry. You ate somewhere. What? This is why when I come to y'all house and y'all be, if it's at a certain time, y'all be like, hey, pastor, you want to eat? I'm No, I'm not eating. No, I'm not eating because I know I got to go home and eat. And I'm not eating twice. And I've gone past faking like I'm still hungry because I ate at your house only to come home and have to eat again. Now I'm eating twice. No, it's not going to work. So I'm going to tell you no so I don't get in trouble when I get home. Amen. <laughs> Listen, I know, I know that there's been some things that your kids have said to you, and you're like, you said what? You had the audacity to say what? Do you know how many hours I was in labor for you? I, you've said it before. Like, what do you mean? You're not going to do what I just, what? Bro, you're going to pour that water out? Nobody else went. Like, it doesn't say the whole nation got up and was like, we got to go get the king some water. These three individuals were like, we got this. And then only to come back and to see this brother pour it out in their face. And what I want to say to you is sometimes what you measure as a sign of disrespect could actually be a sign of respect. Check it out. Send a text. The Bible says in 15 that he said, oh, I'm longing for something to drink. 16, so the three mighty men broke through the camp of Philistines, drew the water from the well of Bethlehem that was at, by the gate, and took it and brought it to, to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink it, but poured it out to who? You missed it. You caught that he poured it out. You didn't catch wh who he poured it out to. He poured it out to the Lord, and then check what he says. Far be it from me, O Lord that I should do this. Is this not the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. So check it out. Like David is saying, in this moment, where I expressed my situation and these individuals went and responded to my situation. I appreciate that love that you just showed me. I, just, I appreciate that loyalty and that commitment that you just showed me. But I also want to let you know that as your king, my responsibility is not to lord my position over you, but my intention is to be your partner as we go on this journey. And so in pouring this out, what I'm saying is I recognize what you just did to me and your expression of commitment. And I want to show you my level of commitment. We missed it. We missed it because we don't traditionally operate in circles that move this way. David is like, yo, I want you to know that my I'm not lording my position over you. Even if you look at the grand scheme of Christianity, like Jesus comes and dies for us. Other religions have an expectation that you're going to die for the God that you're supposed to serve. Not in this one. Jesus said, I'm coming to die for you. I don't want you to sacrifice your children and sacrifice yourself. You can't. You are a sinner. In need of a savior. You dying would just be another sinner dying. What about the death of he who, who knew no sin? Now a payment has been paid for all of the individuals who did commit sin by the one who knew no sin. The Bible says that Jesus did not think his position something that was attainable. Like he didn't think like if I do this, then this is going to move me up the ranks to the point where now I can become God. No, he was God. He is God. 
It was not a position that he was trying to earn. It was who he was. But at the same time, while he's God, he humbles himself and comes to earth and is born as a little bitty baby and comes and dies for you and me. Could he have lorded it over us like, yo, y'all sinners, man. And until you do X, Y, and Z, you're not going to be worthy of my love. Yes, he could have. But his blood was poured out. Oh, y'all missing it, man. David pours the water out. He's like, yo, I need you to understand that I'm in this with you. I'm committed just like y'all committed. Let's do this. This is a beautiful thing. Like when you're on this type of team, when you're running with individuals that move like this, when you're on a job with individuals who everybody's like, yo, we're going to meet the goal, like we're going to all do our part. We're not, not individuals who sit in offices and like, yo, you do this. Like, like when you are on a team with individuals where everybody's like, yo, we're giving our all, we are ready to win this battle. When, when you are in a school with an, a, a professor or a teacher who's like, yo, I'm going to not just tell you what to do, but, but if you don't understand, I'm going to take the time to make sure that you're comprehensive what it is that you need to understand. I'm just as invested into what into your success as you should be in your success. That's the type of team that you want. When you're in a relationship with an individual and they're like, yo, I'm not just in this thing to see what I can get out of it, but, but I am here to make sure that we both arrive at a place of fulfillment and excitement and joy about our relationship. That's the type of relationship you want to be a part of, but, but we can't even comprehend what David is doing right here because we've been in relationships with individuals where it's always about what they want and never about what we want. We work for organizations where it's always about their bottom line and never about our situation. And it's not just in those arenas, even in the church. Even in the church. So I hope you see the loyalty that they were mutually committed to not taking advantage of one another. It's a beautiful thing, like when you could be in a space and you're just having a conversation with somebody. Or maybe you ain't even having a conversation with this individual, but maybe they just in the room and they hear, overhear you saying something. And then not to get applause and not to get a war. Or maybe you're like, yo, I'm feeling some type of way. I'm feeling down. Like, just, I'm just overwhelmed right now. And you ain't even said it to the person that's in the room, but later that night or later that week, they call you and just be like, yo, I'm checking in on y'all. I overheard you say X, Y, and Z, and I just want to make sure you're good. Or you're having a conversation and you're like, man, I love yellow flowers. It just brings joy to my heart. Then a special day comes around and an individual gives you yellow flowers because they were listening to the fact that that just blesses you. And they also overheard you say that blue flowers make you sick. And so they're not those individuals that's just going to bring you blue flowers because they're actually attentive and committed to growing with you. But some of us have been in relationships where it was all about the other individual, right? And we were just tagging along. We've been around so many selfish individuals that we don't even identify with selfless individuals. That's, how we have, that's why we have a hard time accepting Jesus. It's got to be something else to it. It's got to be something else to it. No, it's nothing. He loves you with an everlasting love. Like, he cares about you. I say this all the time. The brother said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Dude, you can't prepare a place for me unless you know me intimately. But here's the thing. We so used to dealing with other individuals who don't mean us no good and operating in realms where individuals don't show that same type of loyalty and commitment that it stunts our growth. So 
So what's your limit? Because I believe that each and every one of us has a limit. I appreciate the fact that David and his guys at this moment, man, they found value in each other. And, and here's what the guys said that went over to, um, to Bethlehem to get the water. They're like, King, if you can dream it, I guess we're going to achieve it. I don't know how, but I guess we're going to do it because it came to your mind. You can dream it, then we're going to achieve it. That's major. Like when you're on a group of team, a, a team with individuals and they're like, man, what about this? And it's like, all right, well, what do we need? Not, not the individuals who are in the room with you and they're like, nah, that ain't possible. The world is full of naysayers. The world is full of nowheres. The world is full of people who are going to tell you that it's impossible. Why would you then surround yourself for the rest of your life with individuals that are already doing what the world is doing? I need some people who believe that though I've dropped out and though I got D's and F's, that it's possible if I put some work in to end up with A's and B's. I need some individuals who believe that though I got fired from one job and two jobs and three jobs, that it's possible for me to open my own company and be an entrepreneur. I need some individuals around me who's like, yo, I know you don't have some bad relationships, but there's somebody that God is going to send your way. Emphasis, God is going to send your way that's going to allow you to feel appreciated and loved. It's not over. I need some individuals around me who are not like, nah, this ain't going to work. It's impossible. I need individuals around me who are like, yo, well, if that's what we, how do we make this happen? And I believe we all need those type of people. But what's your limit? How committed are you? Not just to this team. You know, we're all a part of this team, but every team that you're on, like, what's your level of commitment? David and his men at this point were ready to go. Now, here's the thing. This is the end, this is the end of the story, and they're giving us a recap. And I want to ask you to go somewhere with me. I'm going to let y'all go after this. I want to ask you to go somewhere with me uh, to the end of the chapter. Because it begins naming off. David had like 37 guys, man, who like, they just rocked on a different level. And so there are times, y'all, where you will get to, uh, I'm going to just talk about myself, Henry. There are times when I'll get to a space like this and I'll start seeing all these names, right? And I'll be like, yo, I ain't got time for these names. I don't know what this means. I guess I'm going to just skip to the next chapter to start telling me some more story. But I submit to you, like, there's, some, there's, there's always a nugget embedded in something that we think is worthless. So we read in 18, Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruah, was chief of another three. So there's, there's tears to this thing. Like, the three who are, like, the mighty men that went over, that's a different group than another three, right? And there's some individuals, the Bible says, that, that did some special stuff, but they never attained to the other three, right? Which is important because that means those three had to be committed to maintaining the name that had been put on them, right? Like, we just move a different way. We just operate a different way. And there might be some other groups that are great, but they never attained to the three. And even the three never attained to the one. There was one who was like, man, that's a bad boy. But, but here's the thing. He had to be committed to continually being known as that dude. How committed are you? Like, are there some gifts and abilities that you have and you're like, yeah, I could do that, but I ain't really bought into the whole process yet, so I'm not going to use my gifts yet. I'm going to use half of them. But God wants you to be like top tier. But you like, man, I feel more comfortable being mixed in with everybody else. If you top tier, be top tier. If that's who God has created you to be, like be who he's created you to be. And don't, don't, take it, don't let it go to your head now. This is the thing. This is what David, this is why he poured it out. Because he's like, listen, God called me to be king, but I can't let my position go to my head. I need you to understand that I'm still a part of the team. And my daughter, we were studying this. My daughter was like, man, some of these dudes are bad boys. Like they could have easily went and took David out for real. 
but the commitment was there to each other. Like, I need you to be David. Be the best David that you can be. But I'm going to be the best soldier that I can be. I'm going to do, I'm going to play my part. So check it out. It says, I'm almost done. Joab, the son of Zeruah, the chief of another three, so there was a whole other three, he lifted up a spear against 300 men, killed them, won a name among these three. Was he not the most honored of the three? Therefore, he became their captain. However, he did not attain to the first three. So he was a bad boy, but he still didn't make it up to the next level. Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, the son of a valiant man from Kabzeel, who had done many deeds, he had killed two lion-like heroes of Moab. He also had done, he had gone down and killed a lion in the midst of a pit on a snowy day. That's a bad boy. He killed an Egyptian. A spectacular man. The Egyptian, check out how bad this brother was. But he didn't, he still didn't arrive on the other level with, with the top dude or the other three. Check out how bad he was. Not only did he go into a pit and kill a lion on a snowy day. They ain't have Timberland boots or whatever your favorite winter boots are. He out there, not with Air Jordans, Air Jerusalems. That's what he had on. He like out there in sandals, fighting a lion on a snowy day. But then it says he killed an Egyptian, a spectacular man. The Egyptian had a spear in his hand, so he went down to him with a staff, wrestled the spear out of the Egyptian's hand, and killed him with his own spear. That was a bad boy. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoda, that he did. He won a name among the three mighty men. He was more honored than the 30, but he did not attain to the first three. And David appointed him over his guard. And then it starts naming some people. And I want to ask you to just real quick, y'all. I want to ask you to jump down with me. To verse 31. Ah, Let's say 33 and we'll read to the end. Shema the Herorite, I him the son of Sharar, the Herorite, Elphalet, the son of Ahasbi, the son of Makathite, Elam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilanite, Hezari, the Carmelite, Sheriah, the Arbite, Egal, the son of Nathan of Zoba, Bani, the Gadite, Zelek, the Ammonite, Naharai, the Berathite, armor bearer of Joab, the son of Zerar, Era, the Eridite, Gareb, the Ithrite, and Uriah, the Hittite, 37 in all. Did y'all catch that? A lot of names that we like, yo, man, I don't know who these people are. But when we got to the end, that should be a name that's familiar to you. Uriah who? The Hittite. So remember, this is the end of David's story, but it's recapping the individuals that he ran with. And remember, I said that each and every one of us has a limit. Like some of us, we only move in a certain way. Like I'm only going to do what an individual does for me, right? I need you to know that's not loyalty. It might be a relationship, but an individual, I share this with married couples all the time. I stole this from a friend of mine. I told him I was going to steal it on that day. I stole it, and I told him I was going to use it. I've been using it. I kept my word. He says that marriage, he said at that time, that marriage is the battle of humility. That each and every day of your life, you are seeking to bow lower than your spouse. And you are not seeking to bow lower than them so that they can step on you. Or they're not seeking to bow lower than you so they can step on you. No, I am seeking to see how I might serve you today. Every day in our union. But there are some individuals who be like, yo, if you don't do what I want you to do, I ain't doing nothing for you. And, And I'm submitting to you that that's not the way that God has called us to move as a team. But that's what we're conditioned. That's what we're used to. I got to figure out how I can get what I can get out of this relationship because it might come to an end. Why are you entering into a relationship with the mindset that it might come to an end? 
Don't even start it if that's the case. Or if that is your intentions, at least be honest about it up front. Say to the job, listen, I'm only here passing through. This is not my career. This is just, I'm just here to get a check. I got some bills to pay. Be honest with them. Don't be sitting down in an interview like, yes, this is the place that I always wanted to be. I can imagine myself here for the rest of my life. Like, this is, all, this is what I've always wanted to do. You lying. You building a relationship, starting a relationship based upon lies. And then you wonder why you don't like your manager. And then you wonder why you don't like, no, because you ain't supposed to be there. You lied to get yourself into a place. If you would have told the truth, they'd have been like, nah, this ain't the one for you. Be honest, up front. Because if it's what God has for you, there's nothing anybody can do about it. I've seen some individuals be like, man, I'm so thankful you were honest. Matter of fact, you the type of individual I need on the team because everybody else lied to get in here. I need you to be here because you tell the truth. Matter of fact, let me give you a promotion. I'm going to give you the job that you didn't even apply for. What? But there's a limit for all of us. We got to be careful and know our limit. But Henry, this is what blew my mind. I'm closing. Uriah was one of David's 37 men. Uriah was amongst the individuals who were like, yo, we're going to do whatever we need to do for success to happen. Uriah was amongst the individuals that were like, David, you the king, and I'm willing to do whatever God tells you to tell me to do. Like, man, I'm ready to go. I'm not caught up on positions. I'm committed to the mission. Which means then David hit his limit. What's your limit? David hit his limit. He hit his limit. Because we know the story. David's supposed to be at war with everybody else. David decides, I'm going to stay home and kick back. David sees the young lady across, and he's like, yo, I need her. Go get her. And here's the thing. Like, when you read that story, it don't hit you. It shouldn't hit you the same way. Like, when you read it, it's still bad. Like, man, David went and got homeboy girl. Like, he knew. They told him. But here's the thing. Like, it wasn't just somebody. It was one of David's 37. This ain't just some dude in the kingdom. This is my guy who's like, I'm going to lay down my life. And they told him, like, yo, you know that's Uriah's girl? But David hit his limit. What's your limit? What's your limit? He hit his limit. I know that's Uriah's girl. I know Uriah don't put his life on the line. I know he's not amongst the top three, but I know he's he a bad boy as well. But here's the thing, go get her for me. He hit his limit, y'all. This thing, when you understand it in this context, that whole story with David and Uriah and Bathsheba, like this thing is messed up because now Uriah comes home and Uriah's like yo I'm not going home to party while all of the other 37 and the rest of the nation are out there at war no I'm gonna sleep outside because I'm committed to the process David I know you're trying to get me drunk and I know you're sending me home with gifts and stuff like that man but at the end of the day I'm committed even when man oh my goodness Lord even when other individuals are not committed to the process anymore that does not give you a license to waver on your commitment I still got to do what I got to do they changed their mind they wavered on their commitment but I said God I'm with you all the way to the end. I said, God, use me for whatever you want to use me for. I said, God, I'm going to return a faithful tithe and offering no matter what comes my way. I said, God, I'm giving my life to you, and I'm no longer entertaining those things that I used to do before I got here. And I know my friends who came in with me ain't no longer rocking with you, and I know the individuals that used to be in Bible study are no longer rocking with you, but I got nothing to do with them. I'm still going to maintain my commitment even when other individuals have wavered on their commitment. So what does Uriah do? When David David gets the letter and he says, go, put him at the front of the battle and then have everybody else leave. Uriah said, I have committed to giving my life for this nation. And so while everybody else might leave me, I'm fighting the best that I can possibly fight, even to my death.
because I understand my commitment. Do you understand your commitment? You prayed to God for children. You said, I'm going to be the best mother, best father I can be. God, if you just give me a child, I'm going to take care of them. Have you kept your commitment? Or have you reached your limit? You said, I'm going to be a good steward of all that God puts in my hands. Have you still been keeping your commitment or have you wavered? should not be based upon how man or woman makes you feel. Your, sh your commitment should be solely based upon who God is. Because last I checked, there was a man by the name of Jesus who before the foundation of the world said, I'm going to go and die for them. The world hadn't even been formed yet. He like, I'm going to go die for them. The world was then formed. He was able to see that we crazier than maybe he had calculated. Like these people don't lost their mind. They gonna build a tower up to heaven because they don't trust that God said he ain't gonna send a flood no more. They don't trust it. They like, we, get, we gonna build a tower just in case. He comes down and he walks amongst the individuals. He's like, man, I'm the Messiah that you've been looking for. I check all the boxes that you've been looking for. And they're like, nah, man, we don't like the way you look. We don't like the people you hang out with. The way you move in Jesus is not how we would move if we were the Messiah. And so because you're not moving how we would move if we were the Messiah, we can't accept that you're the Messiah. Bible says Jesus goes and preaches the gospel to individuals and they like yo we need to kill him he talking too much but he made a commitment before the foundation of the world I'm going to go and die for them now was he in the garden like hey this thing is getting real we getting close are we sure we checked off all the boxes yes he did are we sure there's not another way? Yes, he did. That will be done. I gave a commitment. And I'm committed all the way to the end. Despite the fact that some of the individuals that I came to die for, who originally said they wanted me, have changed their mind, I'm still going to follow through on my commitment. Despite the fact that the ones who said they were with me all the way to the end, we read the story like his disciples left that brother. Left him. Wavered on their commitment. It was Peter who was like, man, I'm here. Matter of fact, Jesus, you ain't going to have to die. I'm going to die for you. Three times denied him. Third time, he was cussing up a storm. And yet... He still went to the cross, kept his commitment. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. He's still committed to us being with him for eternity. Question is, how committed are you? How committed are you to your job? You gave your word, there's some things you need to do. How committed are you to your family? And does your commitment to your family outweigh your commitment to your job? How committed are you to your relationships? You entered into an agreement, you said, this is what I want. But does your job or does your family supersede the relationship that you're in? How committed are you to your church? How committed are you to your God? Notice I mentioned him last. 
Because in many ways, that's how we've stationed things in our life. It's our job, our family, our relationships, our church, then our God. And I just stopped by to tell you that maybe just maybe you need to flip that thing around. Start with your commitment to your God. And then let everything else fall behind that because I need you to know he's crazy about you. He wants to be with you for eternity. But you have to be committed to arriving at the place that he's invited you to be. And so my appeal is simple. We're not going to mix it up. If you desire to just be more committed, if you just desire to maintain your commitment, I want to ask you to stand with us as we close out in prayer. If you're still wavering and you still need to measure your commitment, that's fine. That, that's your prerogative. But if you like, no, 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 no. I, I want to follow through on my commitment to the best of my ability. I want to ask you to stand with us as we pray. Because in the midst of our commitment, there are going to be situations that are going to stretch us and stress us and challenge our commitment. All heads are bowed, all eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your mercy, which endures forever. I thank you so much for your commitment to us. I thank you for following through on your promise. For you said that the adversary's head would be crushed. You said that he would be a defeated foe. And you allowed Jesus to come. He was bruised for our transgressions. He went through some situations because of our iniquities. But I thank you, Lord, for following through on your commitment. And now, Lord, I'm asking that you would help us. Even right now, we are standing and saying that we want to be more committed. We want to follow through on our commitments. And I do declare and know that we can't do it by ourselves. We need your Holy Spirit. And so I'm asking right now that you will pour out your spirit on all flesh. Lord, may you be priority in our lives. May you give us the strength to say no to those things that we need to say no to. Say yes to those things you say you want us to say yes to. And give us the wisdom by way of your Holy Spirit to know the difference. Forgive us for our shortcomings, for those times that we've been so unlike you and who you've called us to be. Creating us a clean heart. Renewing us a right spirit. Help us to walk with our head held high and our eyes fixed on you. Until that day when Jesus cracks the sky, when we'll be able to shout, Lo, this is our Savior. He promised to return for us. He committed to return for us. And he has kept his promise. Until that time, keep us faithful. Keep us strong as only you can. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. And amen.